Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our meetup tonight. I am thrilled to introduce Emil, who is going to talk about uh, traffic version 2.0 and some of the updates there. If you could please hold your questions till the end of his presentation, and then he can stick around and I'll run around the microphone, or you can just come on up to ask questions. Um, all right. Thank you, Emil. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Thank you for having me. Uh, I will introduce you a bit what we have been doing on traffic for the version two that we that is out uh, since one week, and uh, and specifically what we can do with uh, traffic in Docker. A bit more about me. Um, I'm a software developer, and I used to be a software developer. I created traffic four years ago, um, and uh, I am also the founder and CEO of Containers, uh, uh, the company behind traffic. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter and GitHub. And so what is Containers? This is a company I created to, uh, to grow traffic. Uh, and uh, we are a strong open source believer, of course, uh, uh, as of traffic uh, is fully open sourced. And uh, we provide an enterprise version uh, on the top of traffic, which come with premium features and with co commercial support, of course. And we are about 30 people fully distributed around the world. Uh, and almost everybody is a software engineer <laughs> in the company. So yeah, um, why? Why did I uh, work on traffic at first? Um, there are already many uh, open source reverse proxy out there, uh, and uh, Nginx, HA proxy, and so on. Um, so first of all, to answer this question, you have to, um, we have to get back into the history of software design. So um, you, you Maybe some of you knows about what, what we were doing back in the 90s uh, with uh, pre-SOR, with a highly monolithic application, with a, um, a tight coupling between all components. Uh, then we, were to, to, we went to SOA a bit later, and then uh, in 2010, we went to a microservices architecture where everything is decoupled, uh, everything is uh, tiny applications talking together, probably in HTTP or something. So this is a real um, evolution of software design. And uh, yeah, microservices um, gave a, a, a great promise, um, but the reality is a bit more complex uh, than what we are dreaming about. And uh, in the reality, uh, in the past 10 years, uh, many, many tools appeared and, uh, uh, to uh, manage how we built and deploy microservices. So Docker was one of these, of course, but you also can think of Kubernetes and traffic. So one of the um, thing, uh, one of the pain traffic is, uh, uh, has been made to solve is to uh, solve the issue, where is my service, right? You, now you deploy hundreds, thousands of applications into production, and from the internet, you need to find the right service between all those, all those microservices. So traffic is a, simply a reverse proxy, a router in front of your infrastructure uh, that is able to uh, route everything to the right microservice. So as I said, um, to um, th this revolution of infrastructure um, is, um, uh, is, is coming with a, a new bunch of tools, right? So you probably recognize a lot of uh, logos here, uh, Docker, Rancher, and so on. And, and um, all of these tools um, are coming to simplify the developer um, a way to uh, build and ship uh, microservices into production. And on the reverse proxy um, side, we, all, we always had um, a tiny issue with existing reverse proxy, is, uh, which is the configuration file. Right? Uh, with traditional reverse proxy, you had to configure the routing with a configuration file. And if you had 1,000 routes, you had to configure a 1,000 routes configuration file, and so on. 
And so each time you deploy a new microservices in your platform, you had to edit a configuration file, a huge one, and um, restart or uh, uh, reconfigure your reverse proxy. And the idea behind traffic is um, why don't we just remove this concept of configuration file? So here comes traffic. Um, this is the main concept behind it. Uh, so you might recognize a reverse proxy in between the internet on the left and your infrastructure on the right. And the idea of the of the basic reverse proxy is to route incoming requests, uh, for example, using a domain name to the right microservice, right? And um, the big difference with traffic is that uh, it's able to connect to the API of your orchestrator of your uh, on your infrastructure, um, just to to uh, guess where are your microservices and what are the microservices deployed on it, right? So just to give you an example, uh, traffic can be connected to Docker, to Swarm, to Rancher, to Kubernetes, and so on. And each time you deploy a new application here, traffic in, will know it and will uh, be able to configure a routing to this application. So. Basically, it delegates the configuration to application instead of having a big centralized file, uh, which is a pain to maintain. So what's uh, behind the traffic project? So uh, as I said, uh, we just um, passed the four years uh, of, uh, of the project. Uh, so it's written in Go, like uh, Docker, <laughs> for example. Uh, it's uh, MIT license, um, it's getting a huge traction uh, with more than 24,000 stars on GitHub, uh, which is uh, really one of the top biggest Go projects. Uh, we just passed 1 billion downloads on Docker Hub. Uh, and just to give you an idea, there are only 10 uh, projects in front of us in official images like MySQL, uh, MongoDB, uh, Redis. Um, we have more than 400 contributors on the project, so I I don't need to say that it's uh, really active. Uh, and yeah, so it was uh, created in 2015 and we just released um, last week the version two. And what, what's inside, right? <laughs> so just a quick overview. Um, to give you more details, we have been working on it uh, during more than one year with a full team on it um, inside the company. And um, uh, so we don't need to say that we have uh, revamped everything from the documentation to the uh, internal uh, structure and design of the software, right? Um, so yeah, we've revamped the documentation to make, to make it more easier to understand. Um, we changed a bit how we configure traffic. We clarified some concepts. Um, we have a new expressive routing rule syntax. I will show you a bit later. And on the top of this, we have, we have really interesting features like middlewares. Middlewares are uh, um, tiny uh, codes that can uh, modify or change the incoming request, right? And you can change, you can chain middlewares together, uh, so you can have multiple modifications on the same request. So that's super interesting and powerful. We now support TCP, uh, which was one of the biggest. Uh, um, uh, request from the user base. Uh, so we not only are uh, L7 uh, reverse proxy, but also L4, which is uh, really powerful. And the beauty of it is that we also support SNI, uh, so based on uh, the host name in the TLS uh, certificate. And uh, so we support SNI routing, and we support listening on TCP and HTTP on the same port at the same time. So that's the beauty of it. You just open one part and you have everything on it. Uh, we have added some um, kind of useful features like canary and mirroring. Uh, so that's super interesting. Canary, you probably know, well, you probably already know what it is. You uh, decide to send, uh, let's say, 5% of your traffic to uh, one server and the, and the rest on the 
other server so it can be useful if you want to deploy a new version uh, of your application and you want to test it. Uh, and mirroring is super interesting if you want to debug what's going on inside uh, uh, your infrastructure. You just send exactly a mirror of all requests sent to one server to another and you can use them to, de to debug. And this is just a quick overview because the real <laughs> um, uh, release notice uh, so huge it does not fit <laughs> inside one page. So let's dig a bit more in uh, the core concept. Uh, so let I, like I said, um, this is basically what a reverse proxy does, right? Uh, routing incoming requests to the right microservice in your infrastructure. Um, and the idea with traffic is that it dynamically discovers traffic tra uh, services because it's connected to your orchestrator uh, natively. So let's dig into the architecture. Uh, so basically, you have uh, in traffic entry points, which are basically the port, the listening port. You have routers, uh, which are basically um, uh, applying rules, matching rules. So uh, is my request match uh, these rules? I will apply this middleware and I will route then to this service, right? This is uh, basically what routers does. And service um, basically is a bunch of servers where it can do some load balancing, some mirroring, some canary, right? So it's, these are basically the three main concepts to understand uh, to make traffic B2 work, it's pretty basic. So entry point, as I said, it's just listening port. So uh, if you have three, three entry point on port 80, 33, uh, 443, and 80, 81, uh, you will basically have three, three entry points, right? Routers, so that's a bit more uh, advanced concept. So as I said, routers are, are here to, first of all, match rules and match requests against rules. And then if, if requests are matching, uh, they will send the request to a middleware chain and then to uh, a service, right? So for example, uh, on the router one here, we have just one rule. Uh, if the host of the incoming request match api.domain, uh, I will route the incoming request to service API, right? Super simple. And on the second, router, you have a bit more complex rule. Uh, if it match uh, this domain and match this pass, uh, you will apply a middleware chains which uh, match some authentication features and then send to the service dashboard. So basically here on the same port, um, uh, sorry, on two different ports, on entry point one and entry point three, uh, you will be able to access um, api.domain and access to a service API and on the second port, uh, you will be able to access eventually the service dashboard if you uh, authenticate uh, against the middleware, right? So that's basically what it does. So middlewares, um, let's dig a, a bit deeper in here. So as I said, you can chain middlewares together. So for example, you can have the first middleware to uh, check authentication. You can have the second middleware who rewrite uh, some part of the request and we can have the third middleware who uh, rewrite a part of the, um, um, a part of the uh, uh, query, for example. And then after all this chain is applied, uh, it will route the request to the right service. So that just, uh, something to apply some changes to some requests. And then services. Um, so services, as I said, is just a group of server, right? A backend servers. And you can apply some load balancing rule uh, on these uh, servers or stickiness with stickiness, or you can apply some canary or some mirroring or these kind of things, right? So all together, again, uh, it's quite simple, three concepts, and you're quite simple. I see some heads shaking. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I mean, it's quite simple for uh, ruling systems, and it's super powerful. That's the main idea. And then the last thing you have to understand to uh, make traffic work, uh, you have two kind of configuration, right? Uh, the first 
configuration is static, so uh, you configure traffic uh, with a static configuration when you launch traffic. So when you launch traffic, you will say, for example, uh, you should listen to the Docker API, uh, which is here. Here is the socket of the Docker API, and this is a static configuration that will never change uh, uh, until traffic is stopped, right? It's static. But you also have a dynamic configuration and you can change the whole routing systems when you want, right? So the routers, the service, the middlewares, the certificates, and so on, all this is dynamic. So you can change once traffic is uh, uh, launched and you can change wherever you want, right? So this is uh, the two main type of configuration, pretty straightforward. So let's see an example with Docker. Uh, so uh, we want to connect traffic to the Docker API uh, using a socket, right? Uh, so you, we want traffic to listen to every Docker uh, event on the socket, and then we want to um, load balance uh, the incoming traffic to uh, several containers deployed on your Docker uh, with your Docker daemon, right? So let's see how it works with the Docker Compose file. Um, all right, so you just deploy, uh, first of all, the reverse proxy traffic, uh, and all you have to do is uh, provide one argument, provider.docker, and let, then you have to mount uh, the Docker socket, the Docker socket, right, onto the container, and this will allow uh, traffic to access to the Docker uh, API. And then you expose the port 80, which is by default, uh, expo I mean, by default used by traffic if you don't configure everything, anything else. And that's it. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, in few lines of code, you have a reverse proxy that is dynamically listening to the Docker API, and each time you deploy a new um, container, traffic is able to root against it, right? So it's pretty powerful. Let's deploy a server. So you can deploy containers. Uh, who am I? It's uh, just uh, um, a tiny web server. Um, and you can apply some labels uh, on it, and those labels will tell traffic how to route a request to this container, right? So here, we will tell traffic, uh, route every request, every incoming request that match um, the host, localhost, uh, to the web app. That's it. So each time we will um, contact traffic with the localhost uh, host name, it will be routed to this web server. So that's super simple. And we can do, we can do uh, a bit more complex um, configurations. Uh, so for example, Jenkins uh, needs to be, um, uh, I mean, means to be deployed with a context prefix, uh, uh, slash Jenkins. Uh, and uh, you, I mean, you need to manage it in your reverse proxy if you don't want to, <laughs> I mean, if you want to make it work. Uh, so this is an example of how to, to do it. So we will, first of all, tell traffic to um, listen to port 8080 of Jenkins because Jenkins is also exposing uh, another port. So you have to tell traffic which one you, you want to use. Um, you have to tell traffic, okay, the routing that will be used. So. Uh, will match mycompany.org domain and will match the pass prefix slash Jenkins. And then uh, uh, we will have to tell the name of the service, but it, this is kind of optional. So yeah, this is an example to match with context. We can do some rewrite also. Um, so here, this is almost the same, but we want, we add a middleware um, that will strip the prefix uh, slash git servers in front of every request. So uh, every request will um, uh, um, come to traffic with slash git server and will end to the backend server without this prefix. Traffic will just rewrite the request, right? Pretty simple. And yeah, traffic works um, without any configuration with WebSockets. Uh, it supports HTTP2, it supports GRP gRPC. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, just a modern reverse proxy which supports basically every um, new kind of protocol. So with a, con a configuration file, on the top of that, um, you can uh, um, temporarily um, 
override a configuration. So for example, if you want, if you already have a uh, few microservices deployed with traffic on Docker, uh, and you want to do a canary release of one of the microservices, right? Uh, you just provide this kind of configuration in a file, or it, it also supports an API uh, system. But here is the file, so you just said uh, here, I want 65% of the traffic on the service uh, app v1, and I, I want 25% on the app v2, the new version. And uh, here are the uh, servers, and that's it. Traffic will just uh, do some canary and uh, uh, super easy, and uh, you can change it, change it dynamically and make it 100% um, on app v2 once you are uh, sure everything is well, right? So that's really simple, and uh, it allows you to safely deploy your application on Docker uh, without any complexity. So let's go into a few demo. Um, and first of all, the, f the first thing I want to show you is um, the first thing I explained with the TCP. So let's do some TCP routing uh, against two MongoDB databases. The first one, and both databases will be um, configured with TLS. So the first one uh, will, will use TLS uh, on traffic, and the TLS termination will be done on traffic. And the second one, uh, will will be deployed with TLS, with the TLS termination done on the database itself, right? So the TLS on the second one should be passed through, so traffic should not um, uh, decipher the TLS for the second one. So uh, all this done on the same part. So let's have a look. All right, so let's see. Um, the Docker Compose that I will use uh, to deploy this. So first of all, uh, I deploy traffic, right? Uh, that listen to Docker, and um, I have um, a tiny uh, file to just configure some TLS because we are using uh, self-signed uh, certificate, so I have to load the self-signed certificate to traffic, but that's not uh, super important. Uh, let's uh, indicate traffic the port uh, that will be exposed, and let's expose it. And then let's, again, mount the Docker socket, the certificate folder, and that's it, right? So that's quite straightforward. And let's deploy the two MongoDB servers. The first one uh, will listen on MongoDB, uh, on, sorry, mongo1.local, and the second one on mongo2.local. Um, and uh, as I said, the first one will be deployed with um, TLS with end termination, I mean, with TLS termination on traffic, and the second one will use path through. So you just have to uh, tell traffic using labels. Okay, here is one, how I want to configure the TLS termination, and it's super simple. I mean, just one line. You decide if you want to do the TLS termination or not, and that's about it. So. Um, Let's docker compose this one. All right. So I have a bunch of things, and uh, let's um, let's test the first uh, connection. All right. So let's just connect uh, to mongo one dot local on port uh, twenty seven oh seven and see how it works, and it works. So here, we connect it to uh, the first database using traffic, and um, traffic is doing the TLS termination, right? Uh, so let's see how it works. So uh, show uh, DBs, right? We have three um, databases. Let's create one, and let's inst insert something in this database. Here it is, and let's uh, stop. Right. So now let's connect to the second MongoDB server. So we connect on the same port, 27017, right? Because it's traffic which is, uh, which is multiplexing everything. And this time we will connect to it um, using TLS2, but TL uh, traffic is not uh, doing TLS termination anymore. Uh, the TLS termination is done on the database MongoDB itself, right? So traffic is doing some TLS path through. And let's see 
if we have some DBs here, and you can see that uh, the DB I created on the first server is not here because it's a different server, so everything works. <laughs> right. All right, whoops. So let's um, have a look at uh, another uh, demo. This time I want to um, use on the same port, I want to mux HTTPS and TCP uh, connections, right, on the same port. So this is quite challenging to, to do, uh, honestly, internally, but we succeeded in that and we think it's a, a huge step forward with reverse proxy. Um, so let's see, whoops, let's see how it works um, internally. So I will just tweet, switch to another demo. Um, Docker compose up the stack and let's see what's inside um, this Docker compose, right? So still traffic, same uh, configuration, right? Listening Docker, certificate, so on. We um, uh, still have our two uh, MongoDB servers, uh, mongo1.local, mongo2.local, right? And this time, so both in TCP and TLS, and this time we have a new uh, web server, Mongo Express, which is uh, basically a web server and a, a UI in front of MongoDB. Uh, so we will deploy this web server and uh, with this kind of rule, so we will listen on dashboard uh, mongo1.local and uh, we will do the TLS termination on traffic, and that's it. So that's, let's see um, how it works. Uh, so again, um, I will try to connect to uh, the first MongoDB server. Let's see how it works, right? So show DBs. So you, with, we still have three um, uh, Databases, uh, so let's create another database uh, and let's insert again another entry and let's exit. All right, so let's connect to the second server. Of course, we will only have three databases like the first time. And now uh, let's connect to um, Mongo link. I, I don't know what, where it opened, but let's, okay, it's here. Uh, okay, so it's a self-site certificate, so I had a warning, but we get it. Uh, and right now we see that um, our web server, so just to explain what's going on, uh, here we are uh, going through the HTTP web server on the same port, 27.0.17, and it's HTTPS, right? So uh, traffic is able to uh, mux everything, and uh, we see that uh, we have the uh, database I just created uh, with the right entry traffic, awesome, right? So it works. All right, uh, where is... I, okay, I think I just, <laughs> sorry for that. I just lost my, let's get back to the demo slides. All right. All right. So let's now see how our, our third demo and let's uh, see how it works, uh, a canary, a simple canary release, there is a typo, sorry. <laughs> um, so first of all, let's uh, docker compose down everything and let's go to the canary demo. Uh, all right. So just a quick overview of the configuration. So we have, uh, yeah, a time, I mean, we have a, a pro, uh, traffic deployed um, with uh, 
a provider file. So this time we can configure traffic uh, just for the demo with the file, right? Just, uh, it's not uh, obviously what you want in reality, but it's just for the demo, it's simple. So basically it will listen to dynamic changes uh, on this file. And each time you change the file, it will reload the configuration and we will um, expose a dashboard because traffic uh, also provide a dashboard, a UI. Um, so then we will have two, uh, we, we will expose two ports, the 80. So this is a reverse proxy port and the 8080, uh, which is by default the dashboard port. That's simple, right? Uh, and then we have two services. Uh, first, first service, who am I, which is uh, again, the simple web server. Uh, and another one, which is Nginx, which is uh, uh, an, a web server too, but another kind of web server. And uh, let's configure on the top of that, um, a, I mean, a canary release between the two. So here is how it works. Uh, so on the host canary that docker dot localhost, right? Um, uh, if we match this rule, we will apply this um, waits on these two services, uh, and this will go on these two applications I, ju I will just I just deployed before, right? So let's Docker up everything, right? So if um, everything works, I should uh, be able to access to oops. Right, I should be able to access to the first server here with this uh, uh, with this URL. I should be able to access to the second server, right? And now with this domain name, I should be able to access to traffic, and it should be doing some canary release. So let's refresh. Yeah. So every four requests, we, we are going on Nginx and so on. So we, are, we have a su super simple um, canary release, right? Uh, and if we want to play and just change the weight dynamically, so I don't know if it will work, right? It's the first time I, I, <laughs> I, I state this, this. Let's say if it works, maybe not. It works, right? <laughs> so you can change dynamically the weight and it will change dynamically uh, the release uh, and you can go from an older release to a new one just like this, right? So that's pretty, pretty powerful, I would say. All right. Um, I will not demo the rest. A uh, few words. Uh, so here I deployed one instance of traffic, uh, but of course um, it's a single point of failure, right? If it fails, uh, it fails, <laughs> so you basically have nothing um, incoming requests. Um, so we also provide um, uh, a way to uh, get high availability with traffic, and basically it comes with a cluster deployment uh, based on Raft, uh, and this comes with our enterprise version, which is built on top of traffic. So basically. Uh, with enterprise version, you are, you, you are getting high availability. So if, if one node fails, uh, or another node will take the incoming request and uh, the node will be restarted. Uh, it brings some security because uh, you have some uh, uh, differentiation between nodes connected to the API and nodes routing the request themselves. So uh, controller, uh, control nodes and data nodes. And of course it brings some scalability because once you are able to deploy your cluster, you are, you are able to deploy uh, as many nodes as you need. So it's scalable by uh, design, right? So yeah, it's basically uh, this architecture, you have a control plane, you have a data plane, everything is scalable and uh, everything is highly uh, available, redundant, resilient, and that's uh, traffic enterprise edition. So it's as simple as traffic to install it, you just use uh, traffic e cuddle that we um, created and it installs on Swarm, on Kubernetes, and it, insta it installs a, in one line, a cluster, and uh, uh, just like this. So it's kind of simple. You can try it here and that's it. Let's now talk about um, our last creation. 
I will say. Uh, you probably have heard of um, ingress and east-west traffic or ingress versus um, service mesh, right? So traffic, well, traffic is basically an ingress uh, router and um, if you want to, uh, so basically it routes requests from internet to your microservices, but if you deploy thousands of microservices, you want to probably manage uh, inter-services communications better. So for example, uh, if you want to do some canary release inside your infrastructure, you want to have uh, this control. If you want to um, observe what's going on inside your cluster, you, you want something. And this is what service mesh does, basically. So um, on the market, you have big names like Istio, that you probably have heard of, and it's great, but it's super complex, and it's more than one gigabyte if you want to install it, so it's huge, and it, it's more than 10 components on Kubernetes. It's really huge. It's almost as big as Kubernetes itself. Uh, so uh, we have been thinking about that, and uh, we came to another thing, which is a bit simpler, and it's named Mesh, right? And there, there is a thing with the AE, right? It's perfect. <laughs> And so it's uh, lightweight, um, easy to configure, light traffic, and more importantly, it's non-invasive, um, and it allows to do everything to, of traffic management and observability, uh, like what it still does, right? And by non-invasive, I mean uh, it does not require a sidecar proxy. Uh, it's only a per node proxy, so if you deploy 2,000 microservices, you will not have uh, 2,000 reverse proxy. You will have only have one reverse proxy per node. So it's a bit less resource in intensive, I would say, and we can basically do everything we want almost with this kind of design, which is a lot simpler. And of course, it's based on traffic, so you don't have to learn anything new, and it's production proven, so that's it. <laughs> So basically, what it does is, okay, you have a traffic ingress controller like you had before, and um, uh, instead of having uh, your pod B connected to your pod B directly in Kubernetes, you will have uh, a mesh instance on each node that will route uh, all the requests between each pod, right? So that's super simple, and it allows us to uh, have some tracing, some uh, metrics, and some uh, traffic management feature, just like that. So yeah, as I said, build on, on top of traffic. One of the good um, use, also, it's fully compliant with SMI, which is an effort uh, initi initiated by Microsoft, by the way, to uh, get a specification on service mesh uh, with a unique interface interface. So, I mean, it's a great thing. If you could have a standard on this, it would be great. So we follow it. And uh, another great news is that it's opt-in by default. That means that if you want to deploy mesh on your cluster, uh, all your services will not go through mesh like this. You will have to decide service by service which one you want to uh, use the service mesh. So it's opt-in. Uh, so I think it's a, a bit more um, uh, it's a bit less stressful than uh, an opt-out uh, <laughs> design. So yeah, um, you can go to uh, the Mesh website and get more info. It's just an alpha release, uh, but it's already fully compliant with the SMI, so uh, we would love to get your feedback on this. And, uh, and uh, thank you. We have some stickers around here if you're interested, and uh, we are also hiring. Uh, if you are interested, you can apply uh, solve, solving this uh, funny puzzle, uh, it's, uh, it will show you if you know a bit more about Docker, uh, and it's funny. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any question, you are wel welcome, and uh, don't hesitate to test Mesh or Traffic V2 and uh, open your voice loud on uh, everything, <laughs> Twitter and everything. Uh, we listen to everyone, so thank you so much. I don't know if we have any question. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, API, API, for example. So yeah, I mean, for Canary, it's a bit specific because it should be kind of temporary, <laughs> right? So uh, uh, usually, we will deploy traffic with uh, a Docker or a Kubernetes or any kind of orchestrator uh, provider plus a file or API provider to get uh, uh, the possibility to override existing configuration temporarily. So you should be use uh, an API provider to pro to uh, to deploy some canary release. So that's an interesting question. How do we um, uh, intercept traffic? So basically, uh, other service mesh do terrible things like uh, rewriting, I, I mean, injecting IP tables on the pod level, which is extremely complex and to me stressful. <laughs> um, we have preferred to, um, so uh, it works on Kubernetes, and we have preferred to make it work with Core DNS, which is the default DNS uh, management system on Kubernetes. So we just inject some rules, and that's it. So it's way more simpler, way more simpler design than Istio, and way less stressful to me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Yeah. The Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. The question is where uh, where does come from the uh, lo the domain names in the demo with localhost and local. Uh, so it just yeah it just um, uh, entries in my uh, AT uh, host file uh, just for the demo. So every time I hit uh, every, something dot localhost, it ends up on my computer. That's it. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. So I showed you, for example, with uh, changing the canary release. So I changed the file dynamically, and it changed dynamically the configuration into traffic without any. Uh, yeah, of, I mean, yeah, of, yeah, but another example would be. Uh, I could have deployed another Docker container, and it would have showed uh, on traffic dynamically, right? Because traffic is listening to the Docker API, so knows everything going on on the. Yeah. So yeah, basically, you don't have any big centralized configuration file with all the routes. Uh, the root is delegate. The root configuration is delegated on each application, which is a lot better when you deploy thousands of applications. So a default route, something. Default. Yeah, yeah, we can do this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the mul multiplexing, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, technically, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Technically, we are just uh, reading every. Um, um, request and we beginning of request. If we see that it's a, uh, if it starts to be a, a TCP connection, we send it to an internal router, an internal TCP router, and on the other end, we send it to the traditional HTTP routing system. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so that's really simple. So basically, it works um, uh, the most simple, uh, simplest way with uh, cookies. That's it, and uh, you can configure everything if you want. 
we are also working on a bit more advanced things like uh, um, hash routing or things like that, which could avoid uh, uh, cookie stickiness cookies. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so not really. Uh, so we made an only early benchmarks, uh, to be honest, and we have not seen any major uh, change between. So uh, to be honest, we are not fighting on performance. We think that uh, as long as we have on par performance with uh, uh, the average, uh, I mean, I'm okay with that because the pain uh, is not on performance usually, but on how we operate it, how easily it is to operate and maintain it. So we just want to focus on this, on simplicity to deploy, operate, and that's it. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's only two weeks old in alpha release, so I, I hope not. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, uh, using, so I, s yeah. Yeah, of course. So, so you have a traffic kernel, uh, which uh, basically used to install and uh, deploy configuration on the cluster. Uh, and uh, basically it talks with uh, control nodes and configure them. So the traffic kernel is come with a, I mean, an automate, I mean, an automated way, yeah, it, it comes with an automated way to install a cluster on Kubernetes and on Swarm. You can install it uh, manually, but it's a bit more complex, of course. The idea is just to install it uh, and scale it and do everything just in one line. I, I don't see any reason why it would not work, yeah. And this is the idea. Yeah, <laughs> the idea with mirroring is, uh, yeah, to mirror uh, some traffic from eventually some production to some uh, integration on test uh, platform and just to debug and do stuff. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, our next speaker is Derek. Um, Derek, do you want to come and get set up? Everyone, if you want to grab any more pizza, drinks, bathroom break, uh, restrooms are right through the double doors here and to the right. Um, and then in about five minutes, we will pick up with Derek on Container D. All right, so before we get started, uh, I just want to make a couple of announcements. First, again, thank you so much for coming to tonight's meetup. It's great to see everybody. Uh, Docker is hiring, particularly in San Francisco, for engineering and sales engineering positions. If you go to our careers page, uh, see if there's anything interesting, you can always email me, Jenny at Docker, J E N N Y, at docker.com. Uh, anything community related, job related, any feedback from tonight. Um, and now our second and last presentation of the night, uh, Derek from Docker, Containerd maintainer, and he's going to share Containerd updates. So thank you, Derek. All right. Hello, everyone. 
so as Jenny said, I'm Derek McGowan. I'm a software engineer here at Docker. I primarily work on Containerd and maintaining Containerd. So I'm going to go a little bit on kind of some of the design of Containerd as well as some of the recent updates. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Containerd is, uh, we call it the container runtime. I put it in quotes because uh, I realize the term container runtime is confusing to a lot of people. A lot of things are called container runtimes. Docker is called the container runtime. Sometimes Kubernetes is called the container runtime. Uh, Kata containers, um, it's that same confusion. So think of Containerd as sitting below the platform level. So it's sitting below Docker or Kubernetes. Uh, and it's sitting above these lower level runtimes like Kata containers or Firecracker um, or Gvisor, if you've, if you've heard of any of those. Uh, think of Containerd kind of as a, a resource manager. It's managing all your container processes. It's managing all the image artifacts uh, that you might pull down from a registry. It's also managing the, the file system snapshots uh, that are going to manage the rootfs of your container. Uh, it also has a lot of metadata and it holds the dependencies between all these objects. Uh, it has a garbage collector that will manage all these resources for you. Containerd is also uh, very tightly scoped. Uh, we have, a, we have an API that's, that's pretty limited in, in what its functionality is compared to, compared to Docker. Uh, and we, we've kept that API, or we've kept that, that scope pretty small, and we require 100% maintainer approval before we would increase, that, increase uh, that scope. So that's only been done once in the lifetime of Containerd when we added the CRI plugin. So Containerd today, uh, we've graduated in CNCF earlier this year. Uh, we were the fifth project to do so. Uh, we have broad support across many different companies. Almost every major cloud provider is using Containerd in some way today. Uh, and we also have support for Linux and Windows. So the latest release of Containerd 1.3 uh, should be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, we're in the RC period right now. Uh, what's new is we have support for our Shim v2 API on Windows. Uh, there's also a new Windows implementation, uh, lower level runtime uh, that we'll be uh, making use of. Uh, we have a device mapper snapshotter um, that was contributed by the Firecracker folks who are using it uh, to get better support for VM runtimes. Uh, we also have a new plugin interface that will make make it easier to extend Containerd for things like encryption and new compression algorithms. Um, and as well as in the CRI plugin, we have a per pod uh, container shim support now. So basically what this allows is if you have for one single pod in Kubernetes, uh, you can have a single shim that's managing all your containers. And uh, by the end of it, you should have a pretty good idea of what, what a shim is. Uh, so let's, let's go into kind of the architecture of Containerd. Uh, you'll see the, the big middle box is really the Containerd daemon. Um, each of those uh, boxes underneath it are the, the different components of it. Um, on top of Containerd, we have the we have the different clients. So it could be Kubernetes, uh, Docker itself is a client of Containerd. Uh, we have uh, tools such as BuildKit, which use Containerd, and then all these platforms on top, which is call into it. Uh, you also see a variety of different shims implemented for the different uh, lower level runtimes. So Containerd has a client server design. Uh, all the higher level operations are implemented in the client. Uh, that's usually where we encourage new functionality to go. So if you have some creative way you want to use Containerd, usually that can be done in the client, uh, the low level or the, the server is a lo little lower level, and the interfaces that, uh, that are there, uh, they're all exposed to uh, gRPC. So that API is stable as of 1.0. Uh, so you, you can trust, if you're implementing against that API, it's, uh, it's not going to change in Containerd uh, 1.x. Uh, the Containerd backend, uh, we have these service interfaces that gives you access to all the different components. Uh, so all these, are, they're pretty low level. Uh, we wrap all of those in a metadata store so that we can provide namespacing. Uh, so this allows, for example, Docker and Kubernetes to use a single instance of Containerd uh, without overriding each other's metadata or containers. Uh, so if uh, Kubernetes were to pull a uh, container down and then you're doing something else with Docker, 
they wouldn't necessarily need to interfere with each other. And then we have snapshotters implemented directly in Containerd. So these will be uh, your familiar OverlayFS, ButterFS, uh, device mappers in there now. Uh, these are all the copy on write file systems. Uh, they can be either union file systems or block device implementations. So device mapper, block device, there's a few other uh, community ones um, that you can find out there for uh, block device implementations. Uh, the snapshotters are also used to hold the, the read write layer for your, for your container. So the rootfs will be able to find it inside the, the snapshotter. So we also have, we also uh, support Prometheus for doing metrics in Containerd. Uh, so unlike in Docker today, like there's different ways to get the container metrics in Containerd, we're just using Prometheus, whether it's you're getting the metrics about the Containerd process or your individual containers, uh, these are all exposed uh, through, through that Prometheus API. So you can just attach your Prometheus client to it. Then I mentioned the Kubernetes support. So we have the, um, we have a CRI implementation directly inside the Containerd daemon so that you can, you can have your Kubernetes kubelet talk directly to Containerd uh, without anything needing to sit in between. Uh, and the CRI API is actually, is actually a service on top of the existing Containerd API. So there's no new endpoints. Um, there's no new endpoints listening uh, for, uh, for CRI. It's just using the existing Containerd API uh, gRPC server. So from the daemon perspective, you think of it as we have a stable gRPC interface for interacting with the Containerd daemon. Um, and then we also have the ability to talk to it directly from uh, Kubernetes runtime. So, Containerd implements this smart client model. I mentioned kind of how we have these lower level components. Uh, so functionality can be implemented inside of the client. Uh, so our gRPC API kind of mirrors these, these internals that we have, these, these lower level services. Um, so things like snapshots, content, containers, all these kind of low level container primitives uh, are actually directly exposed to our gRPC API. Um, and then the, the client is intended that you can implement a bunch of different use cases. It's, it's intended to be general purpose. So you can use it for a normal container runtime, you can use it for a builder, or you can use it for something that, you know, we might not even uh, know what that is today. So I'm gonna go through kind of what a poll, an image, uh, an image poll will look like with Containerd. Uh, so in this model, uh, we have the client you can see in the, is the, the blue box in the middle. Uh, the registry on the left. Uh, the registry is just going to be serving up the distribution API, which is now part of OCI. And then on the right, we just have Containerd and the different services uh, that Containerd exposes. So Paul's gonna start off by going directly to the registry and it's going to get a manifest. And that manifest is going to list all the resources that are associated with an image. Uh, the client is just gonna put that directly into Containerd. And then it's going to it's going to look at all the resources that are associated with that manifest and it's gonna go back to the registry and it's going to fetch each individual, uh, each individual object that's part of that image and it's gonna store it in container D. Now for each of these layers, it's going to go to container D, it's going to prepare a new snapshot, it's going to apply that diff into that snapshot um, and that diff service is basically gonna read the layer that was, that was just fetched, it's going to mount it and it's going to unpack unpack that layer and it's going to return the layer descriptor and then the client is actually responsible for committing that snapshot and in the end the client will just create an image from the snapshot that it or from all the artifacts that it just pulled um, as well as a reference to that snapshot which was just unpacked. Likewise pushing an image in Containerd is, is much simpler uh, since we have these artifacts that are already inside of Containerd's uh, content store. So first off, the client is just going to go to the image service. It's going to get the image, which is going to point at some manifest. It's going to read that manifest from Containerd. And then for each of the layers, it's gonna read them, push them to the registry. 
and then in the end, it's just going to push that manifest, and that's all that it's involved in a push. Run is slightly more complicated. Um, you'll see on the left, we still have the client there in the, in the middle, container D with the services. Um, on the left, you'll see we have the runtime v2 inside of container D as well as a shim. The client is only going to interact with these, service, these services, uh, but the task service is going to, underneath it, operate uh, with the runtime, the runtime v2, which is going to communicate with the underlying shim. Uh, so when you actually go to run an image, the first thing the client is going to do is it's going to prepare the rootfs. Uh, so it's going to go to the snapshot service, it's going to prepare a new snapshot. Uh, and it's going to go to the container service, it's going to create a new container. Um, and then it's going to go to the task service uh, using that container ID and it's going to create a new task. That task is going to uh, pass that down to the runtime. And the runtime is actually going to execute a new shim. And that shim is going to be responsible for everything associated with that container process. So the shim is what holds, is the parent of your actual container process and it's used in order to capture all the, all the standard in, standard out of that, uh, of that process and hand it back to uh, container D or um, anything that's passed to it. So the crate is going to execute this new uh, shim and then uh, once, that, once that shim is created, it actually sets up an RPC connection so that the, so that the runtime can send commands to that. Uh, send commands to that shim. So the first thing it's going to do is it's just going to tell the shim that it's going, it wants to create a task. Uh, the runtime's going to pass that back to the service, which is going to pass back the PID to the client. At this point, you have the PID. The client can do anything it needs to that container before starting it. So a common thing that is needed to do to a container before starting it is attach it to a network. Uh, so any, any sort of network setup is done uh, in between this phase. Uh, and then the client is going to set up uh, an exit channel to wait for the container and then it's going to actually start it. Um, after that, the, your container is running. Once that container uh, process finishes, uh, that wait command that was sitting there waiting on an exit channel um, is going to exit in the back end and that's going to return back to the client. Um, and then at that point, the client can start cleaning up the container. So the first step is going to delete the task. The task uh, will get passed all the way down to the shim, and then once the shim has no more tasks associated with it, uh, the runtime will shut down that shim. So that process that was being used to hold the uh, container process can now go away and you have no more uh, shim process. Um, and then just delete the container, and the snapshot can then be deleted as well. Uh, it's no longer needed. So the summary is that we've got a daemon that has these loosely coupled components. The client combines these components together uh, to create a general purpose API. So if you're using container D, you're probably using our Go client, uh, which has all the implementation for this. So you as a user of container D probably don't know about all these individual services, uh, but you'll call a Go function that will look like just pull. Um, but it does allow you if you have any anything that you want to do that's different, like you have a different registry, you, you have some completely different way for distributing your images, you can do that with ContainerD. ContainerD uh, doesn't really care how you set up the, the file systems. And that kind of gets into ContainerD and its, its pluggability. Uh, so internally, everything in ContainerD is a plugin. Uh, so all the boxes that you saw earlier in that architecture diagram internally to ContainerD, those are all plugins. Uh, they're all loosely coupled. Uh, they, all have, they all have interfaces which define uh, the boundaries between them. Um, and they all, have a, uh, they all have a dependency or these interdependencies. And we have a plugin manager which will manage these dependencies and make sure that they're loaded in the correct order so that when your plugin starts up, it can have all of the interfaces that it needs to talk to. So, this would be an example of a service plugins. They need the underlying runtimes and metadata uh, in order to service that actual API. Likewise, the metadata uh, plugin will actually uh, wrap the snapshot and content plugin so that it can add namespacing around them. 
So today you could extend containerd by recompiling it. So you can add a file under command containerd inside your fork and you can import whatever you want. Um, you could also create your own main.go containerd. Uh, it's pretty simple, like we just have the command, you just uh, import it, run these few lines and you have your own uh, containerd instance. Uh, additionally, we have many ways to, to add plugins to Containerd without actually having to recompile it. So we have some proxy uh, plugins. Uh, basically, since everything in Containerd is a gRPC service, uh, likewise, you can actually have, you can attach an implementation of that gRPC service to Containerd. So Containerd will actually proxy those services uh, to your plugin. Um, for the runtimes, they actually use a, a binary path so that you just add the binary to a specific path and it will be able to use that in order to, to add a new runtime to Containerd. So you don't need to restart Containerd or anything to add in a completely new runtime. Uh, all you need to do is uh, make it visible to Containerd. So let me go over an example of a snapshot or proxy plugin and see how it, uh, how it works. So this is, this is the gRPC definition for the snapshot service. Uh, it's pretty simple. There's not that many commands to it. They're mostly what you'd expect. Uh, you prepare a snapshot, um, you commit it, you can remove it, you can get stats. Um, update is mostly related to metadata. You can list them. So if you want to implement that interface and make it available to Containerd, uh, we have a configuration called proxy plugins. Um, what's on the left would be a, a uh, binary where you just take your custom snapshotter and you can make it listen uh, on any socket you define. You, def you configure Containerd uh, to use that address and that's it. Like it's, it's, it's pretty small from the perspective of like what it takes to get the get this binary up and running. It's just a regular gRPC service. Uh, we have a uh, mapper which will just take your snapshotter and convert it to, to something that can be directly used by a Containerd or by a gRPC server. For the runtime plugins, um, this is probably where you'll see more activity today. So the SIMV2 is already widely adopted. Um, so if you've heard of GVisor, it's that uh, sandbox container stuff that uh, Google's been working on. It uses a emulated kernel um, to uh, basically intersect all the, the kernel commands uh, so that you can run any Linux app. Uh, Kata containers are more traditional uh, VMs. Uh, Windows is actually implementing the same, uh, same approach. Um, and Firecracker is it's a little lighter than Kata containers. It's uh, pretty new, but it has some limitations in terms of uh, what it makes available uh, inside the container. So the, the Shim v2 API, it's also just a gRPC API. Um, it's, it's pretty minimal in terms of what it, uh, what it requires you to implement. Um, mostly around the execution of the individual container lifecycle. Uh, I mentioned the binary, it's just adding a binary to the system. So we have a, a naming convention for, for finding these. So if you give a runtime io.containerd.runsc.d1, uh, in this, in this case, it will look for this binary in the runtime binary path. And it will, when it actually goes to execute a container using that runtime, it's going to execute that binary. Uh, so this is really useful for, especially the VM uh, implementations, which uh, when they were, before when they were trying to mimic the run C CLI, there's a lot of limitations to that. Um, it basically had to try to look like a normal Linux process when it wasn't a Linux process, it was actually a, a VM hypervisor manager. Um, so you'll see like, this is the task API we have today, and we added some things to it that made it much easier for VMs, uh, such as third from the bottom, you see stats. Uh, previously, stats were uh, 
you'd get the stats from the system, but uh, you'd go to look at the C groups that's actually being used by by the, the shim process. Um, but if you're using a VM runtime or something, uh, any of those stats may actually be calculated by the hypervisor, uh, not necessarily what is visible from the, from the operating system. So this gave a little bit more flexibility uh, to the implementations and that actually made ContainerD much simpler in the way it handles runtimes. Uh, so being able to, to push some of that stuff into, into the shim, it's really beneficial for everyone in this case. So otherwise, other than that, you'll see they're pretty normal commands. We mentioned earlier in the run example, you have a create, uh, you have start, you have delete, you have shutdown, um, and then some stuff related to doing checkpoint restore um, and execing inside of that, inside of that container. So Kubernetes CRI, uh, CRI stands for the Container Runtime Interface. So this was added to Kubernetes a, quite a while ago. It's just a gRPC interface. Um, basically it enables Kubernetes to talk to a variety of different runtimes. Traditionally, Kubernetes was uh, talked to Docker directly over this, this Docker shim that they have, uh, just use the Docker API, uh, but that made it hard for uh, other runtime implementations to integrate with Kubernetes, so they added this uh, CRI implementation to make that much, much easier. Uh, it, it looks pretty similar to what you would see in the Docker API. It's a little higher level, has full and just basic, uh, basic API functionality that is very similar to the Docker API, but it's a subset to uh, mirror what Kubernetes needs, and as well as add some pod specific stuff to it. So in ContainerD, we have our plugin, uh, which is built in since ContainerD 1.1. Uh, um, the plugin itself has gone GA uh, it's a year and a half ago now. So you can actually see it in production in quite a few of the cloud providers. Uh, GKE was the first one, first one to use it in production. Um, so if you see the difference when you're using the CRI plugin in ContainerD versus uh, using Kubernetes with Docker. Uh, so today you're gonna have, if you're using Docker, you're gonna, uh, the kubelet's gonna use a Docker shim to talk to Docker. Docker is going to talk to ContainerD in order to uh, manage your containers. And then that's actually gonna uh, spin up your containers. Uh, and this, uh, when you're using the CRI plugin, it's just talking, Kubelet can just talk directly to ContainerD. Internally, the CRI plugin is, is itself a ContainerD client. Um, so I, I mentioned how we have these service interfaces and how they, they mimic gRPC. Um, so likewise, the CRI plugin can actually uh, both run outside of the Docker or the ContainerD process or um, when it's running inside of the ContainerD process. They're just straight function calls from the client. Um, that's because in the, the gRPC service just, services just uh, map to directly what we have underneath it. So CRI has its own uh, image service and runtime service in its definition, um, but additionally, CRI is gonna handle things like um, what is a pod, what containers go in a pod, uh, stuff like the pods container is not a concept that we have in the ContainerD core that's used to hold namespaces and C groups open uh, so that when it's configuring, uh, configuring networking, it has uh, all of that open. Um, so the CRI plugin is just going to use CNI, um, but that's actually done in, only inside the plugin. Uh, you won't see anything related to CNI inside the core ContainerD API. So if you want to use ContainerD today on your Kubernetes cluster, um, probably already have Docker installed. Uh, so if you add this flag to Docker to enable the CRI uh, plugin, I think by default, I think we're still disabling it in our, in our Docker installs. Um, and then you just set these kubelet flags to talk to ContainerD. And then after that, 
the kubelet will just be talking directly to container D on your kind of existing setup. You can still use Docker uh, for everything that you use Docker for today. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. Well, so the roadmap itself is, is pretty small in terms of like, we don't have a bunch of, uh, we don't have a bunch of like huge features that are going into it. Most of it's related to like bug fixes or we're working with like, in like different parts of the roadmap will be driven by specific companies. For example, like uh, Microsoft uh, and getting all the Windows support into CRI, um, they're kind of driving that. So. I wouldn't say we have like one unified roadmap. Um, for the most part, like different maintainers from different companies will kind of push forward on the different parts of it. So us at Docker kind of drive forward the different parts related to the Docker integration, uh, whereas like Microsoft folks would actually push forward on the, on the Windows integration. Um, the, all the CRI stuff was originally from a team at Google. Uh, so most of the CRI stuff comes from there, but um, there's also some contributors from, from IBM. So we don't really have like a, a unified roadmap for uh, like across all of ContainerD, just kind of these different fronts where uh, different maintainers are mostly on that. So it's, ContainerD is kind of in a position today where we have a lot of contributors, but everyone kind of agrees on what container D should be and shouldn't be. Um, so we don't really have a lot of issues with like large roadmap items getting like dumped on uh, the maintainers that we're, that we're trying to push for. All right, is that it? All right, thank you.